My name is Sue Shardlow. I'm one of the co-organisers here at Ladies of Code London. This is the sixth in our Get Into series where we demystify roles in the tech industry. So we've already had Get Into Web Development, Get Into Testing, Get Into Product Management, and Get Into Engineering Management, and Get Into Gaming and AI. Most of them are on our YouTube channel, which we can share the link with you later. So tonight's uh, event is Get Into Data Engineering, and this is a first for Ladies of Code because we've got not only one, but two guests tonight. But before I introduce them, this is normally the point at which in an in-person meetup, I would let you know where the fire escapes and the loos are. And hopefully you know where they are in your own house because I can't help you with that. So for your own health and safety, please familiarise yourself with the location of those facilities. So we are looking to feature more tech roles in this series. So if you've got, uh, if you're in a role that hasn't been featured yet and uh, you think it would be interesting to demystify that, or you know somebody who is, please reach out to us um, or let them know to contact us and we'd be really happy to have a chat with you about that. So, like I said, we've got two guests here tonight. It's a real treat. These folks, I've known them for a little while now and they are just a pleasure to work with. So Sarah Usher is a senior data platform developer and tech lead. She started out as a software engineer, creating apps in various industries and found her calling in data and the back end. She loves the back end. I've asked her to do CSS before, help me with my CSS. She said no, yeah, she, was, she loves the back end. Valentina Romeo is a data engineer at Sainsbury's Digital. She started her career in biomechanical engineering before moving into software development. The systems she creates now handle large volumes of data in the retail industry. Now I'm really pleased, like I said, this is a first for Ladies of Code London now. We've got two guests instead of one. And what they're going to be showing us is two sides of the same coin. So I think that's gonna be really cool because I'm not an expert in data engineering, so I'm gonna be learning along with you. So Sarah and Valentina met when they were at an ad tech company handling huge volumes of data at high speed. As you can imagine, people are clicking like every millisecond of the day and this data's all gotta be uh, funneled through somewhere. And somebody's gotta design the systems that do that. And many people have heard different things about data. And we normally think about data analysis and data science, but we don't necessarily know about the data engineering roles available. So Sarah and Valentina are here to demystify us that for us tonight. So welcome, Sarah and Valentina. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Valentina. Thanks for joining us tonight. I know you're really busy. You've just started a new job, haven't you? Yeah, no. It's actually it's a, it's a good um, diversion. I mean, it's, it's good to join your meetings uh, always. So, yeah. It's highly recommended, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Okay, well, let's start with you then, Valentina. So can you let us know, I just said that you started a new job, so that was a bit of a spoiler. Let us know uh, where you work now and how long you've been in data engineering. So uh, at the moment I'm working uh, uh, for Sainsbury's um, uh, data tech uh, department. Uh, I started a couple of months ago, so it's quite a uh, new job. I, I started to work uh, um, in a, uh, re remotely, basically, which is not easy at all, to be fair. But I'm quite enjoying staying there. It's a quite challenging uh, uh, work, but I quite like it. I I became a data engineer uh, almost um, two and a half years ago. And when I was working with Sarah in the same company, same advertising company. And uh, yeah, my background, as you said, is more, um, I have a master degree in mechanical engineering. I work as a mechanical engineer for seven years, but uh, one day I just woke up and said, <laughs> I want to be a software engineer. So go to the uh, dark side of the engineering and um, and I started basically uh, my career as a Java developer uh, and then moved to data engineering. Cool, thanks for that. Sarah, how about you? I think I have officially been in data engineering for about two years, um, but I used to do a lot of data backend processing before data engineering was a real thing. So uh, back-end development used to just be anything on the back-end. There, was, there wasn't really um, any distinguishing characteristics. And I just happened to have done some data processing and, and data warehousing and 
lots of queries and stuff like that before, which is now, uh, now fits into the data engineering field. Cool. Okay. So you, like I said before, and you've just touched on, you were a software engineer. So how did you actually make that leap into data engineering? Um, it was not so much as a leap as just a pivot. <laughs> um, I think especially, I think, oh, how do I clarify this? I was a fairly backend focused developer. I think there would be more of a leap if you are a front end focused developer and you want to go into data engineering. Being, having been a back end developer and um, been around when data engineering was becoming a thing, um, I kind of had a lot of very relevant experience already. So it wasn't so much of a change. However, one thing that is true is that it is a lot more defined than it used to be. And I definitely had gaps. So I didn't necessarily have everything. I couldn't just say I was suddenly a data engineer. I did still have to learn things. Yeah, I think that's true of a lot of jobs in software and, and building systems and stuff, isn't it? Cool. And Valentina, how about you? Would you say it was more of a leap or a pivot? Uh, well, I honestly, I didn't intentionally decide to, to become a data engineer. It happened just because in the um, team I was working at, at the moment uh, in, um, the, in the same advertising company, um, I, they were doing projects that I wasn't interested uh, on anymore. And I decided to uh, basically rotate to the data engineer team because in uh, our company, you could basically rotate in different teams. I said, why not? So I'm going to do that. I'm going to stay there working as a data engineer for uh, two weeks. And uh, then I will I'll go back to my uh, previous team. But I actually really enjoy working uh, as a data engineer because, uh, as Sarah said, um, it's a still back-end engineering but uh, it's more focused on data and uh, so i start to learn new things i start to appreciate also uh, different uh, uh, different stuff different fields I haven't I haven't uh, um, touched before so and yeah so i spent there almost two years in that team so yeah it was supposed to be two weeks but yeah in the end i quite enjoy stay there so yeah, it's that same old thing, isn't it? Just come and help us out for a bit and then you end up staying forever. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So like I mentioned before, you both met when you worked with the same company. So you were both working at an ad tech company. Um, and I think it might, and different teams, in da different data engineering teams. And I think it might surprise people to know that actually some companies not only have one data engineering team, but they have more than one. So can you tell us, and I know, Valentina, you've moved on now, but what's your current team at Sainsbury's responsible for? Uh, at the moment, it's quite different than uh, what I used to do uh, in, um, uh, in the advertising, in my previous job where I work with Sarah, because uh, uh, now it's more focused, it's basically uh, more similar to Sarah's job. Uh, so it's more focused on building uh, a solid pipeline, move uh, data, a uh, big volume of data, um, and uh, also basically process this data storage, uh, uh, create queries uh, uh, to basically um, use this data. In, um, in my previous company, um, yeah, it was quite weird. We had two, as you said, the two different teams, data engineering teams. My team was more focused on uh, uh, the machine learning um, uh, part. So I basically, my, my role was um, helping the uh, data modelists, the data analysts, sorry, to uh, put the uh, model in production. So basically the engineers um, work, work on uh, building the infrastructure and the architecture to make the models uh, quite quick and uh, also, um, yeah, basically ready to be uh, put in production. At the moment, we are not in the machine learning uh, um, group. I'm more in the, um, basically, um, uh, manage the uh, big pipeline to moving data, using this data more for uh, company operation. So, yeah. Cool. And what tech stack are you using to do that? At the moment, the, um, I'm using a Python, um, SQL, well, of course, and uh, um, Spark as well. 
um, and uh, what else the other, <laughs> other many uh, yeah but primarily these ones yeah cool thanks for that and Sarah you're still working in the ad tech industry aren't you so what um, what's your team responsible for and what tech stack are they using so my team is responsible for collecting all of the incoming data so in this particular domain that is things like ads that failed to work or got clicked on or um, how far they got played into before someone stopped it, all that kind of information. And we also um, keep data on auctions. So, so advertising works in different ways. One of the ways you can participate is in an auction and we retain all of this information as well. So I think we were processing at one point about 120,000 events a second. Um, which is large. It's not as large as other companies, but it's pretty big. <laughs> it's large enough to be challenging. And um, so we would look after the, the ingestion layer that uh, collects everything and the storage of that information as well as the distribution of that information out. So, uh, and what we collect is also not very well defined. So there's a lot of processing that goes into that so we would take care of that as well as well as reporting so we would also take care of the reporting tooling that where that would be feeding to other systems um, a different data model that they had so taking our model and changing and putting in their model and giving it to them or um, actually keeping the front end reporting tool up and running that was my team's responsibility as well Cool. Okay. And I think we, we better get this out of the way now, because I think a lot of people have heard of data science, they've heard of data analysis, they haven't necessarily heard about data engineering. So can you just tell us like how data engineering differs from all of those? I used uh, to work with the uh, data science. So it was uh, basically uh, the person involved to create the models. So it's primarily the person who uh, creates the model, um, use the data um, and uh, try basically to optimize them. And uh, it's mainly um, involved with the machine learning um, field. Then uh, the data analyst is who basically uh, analyze the data. For example, if you provide a, a dashboard with some uh, uh, graphics, so the data uh, analyst uh, will see the data, uh, the trend of the data, and give some uh, consideration on that. And then there are the um, data engineers. So basically, they build the uh, infrastructure behind. So there are uh, different uh, parts of data engineering, like the DevOps part, which is uh, building the infrastructure. Uh, the uh, also the back end, like for example, um, uh, coding with Python to create a logic, uh, how to uh, basically um, use this data, and uh, um, also there is uh, uh, a, part, a big component of uh, uh, SQL, SQL knowledge as well. So is basically uh, what we do is uh, uh, create uh, all the um, uh, the, the, the part uh, to allow the uh, data modelist to uh, use the data they need to create the models, the data analyst to receive the data they need, and uh, um, we also have uh, the well, the data science as well to create uh, the uh, machine learning uh, models. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's basically they are all linked together. They are not the same uh, person. They are different roles but they are all linked together and uh, each of them uh, is essential for each of other. I'm glad you said they're all different roles because uh, a lot of people that you speak to in different disciplines, sometimes the job titles can be the same for the same role. Uh, so it's very difficult to tell, but actually in data, they are very discreet disciplines, aren't they? So data analysis is very different from data science and very different from data engineering. Cool, okay, so I'm glad we've uh, sorted that out. So you're both at different stages of your data careers and in your software careers. So what would you say, what experience would you say somebody needs to get their first role in data engineering? Well, <laughs> well in my case, uh, um, as I told you, I, I didn't have many experience uh, uh, as a data engineer, but for the, my second job, I, uh, I learned 
I need to have uh, uh, more experience. I, well, I, I developed them after basically my first experience as a data engineer. And I think uh, the most important knowledge you need to know are, uh, well, firstly, the programming knowledge, like uh, you need to know about Python or Spark or whatever. So this one is important. SQL as well, you need to have a strong knowledge on uh, uh, the, the database, how they work, and uh, uh, cloud infrastructure. Um, that one is really important, in my opinion. And the uh, uh, data pipeline is also uh, um, a knowledge, in my opinion, needs uh, to, to have. I don't know if you agree, sir, but in my experience, uh, the, the work done, yeah. Yeah, I think um, a lot of software development has moved away from database knowledge. And um, this is unfortunate, uh, but that database knowledge in terms for the data engineering role is very important. Um, understanding how to structure tables, understanding how to write good optimized queries and that sort of thing still remains in a very good skill and it's an integral skill to this job. Cool. Okay. And just building on that, Sarah, you've hired quite a lot of folks. Uh, you're a hiring manager. What sort of things do you look on for on people's CVs when you're hiring them into your team? It depends what they are there for, because I think for this kind of role, um, you can't exactly put out a you know data engineer with 10 years experience in data engineering because they don't exist. Um, so it depends what we'd be looking for. Um, to be quite honest, someone at a junior or mid-level level, I would be looking at more at what they're interested in. Um, so if you're interested in what data can do for a company or you have maybe even an interest in secure data um, and you are quite keen on understanding the domain that you're in, that's very interesting to me. On a, on a senior level, I would expect a senior to come in with um, some technical experience around data warehousing, databases, building distributed systems, understanding um, distributed computing principles, data architecture principles. Cool. And if somebody's trying to get their first role, um, what sort of portfolio could they build up to demonstrate that they could that they've got the skills to do that? Well, um, what, what I think is, well, I have done, for example, uh, many uh, personal projects, uh, on projects uh, outside of work. So on my GitHub, uh, there are a few projects, or even, uh, um, well, some stuff. Uh, basically, I, I put my GitHub uh, link on uh, LinkedIn, so people can see I've done uh, this kind of uh, work. And um, this one, in my opinion, could be a good portfolio uh, for, um, yeah, when you're looking for a job and, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think... Anything that you, sorry, anything that you particularly look for in terms of, like... Yeah. Of so this is where the interest part would come in. Um, anyone who has been playing around with pandas or um, queries on databases. I know it sounds like a weird thing to have in your GitHub, but you can put that in your source control. Um, someone who's got a portfolio piece working with a data set, whether that be an API or a file or whatever it is, um, and has tried to produce something from that, either a another service that puts the data into a nice API or visualizes the data, something like that, um, that would be a very good portfolio piece, those examples. Also, uh, for example, um, another good one could be also using uh, how to use Airflow, the Airflow pipeline, which is something uh, yeah. uh, not many people know how to use. And uh, it's good because you can do um, easy a uh, project uh, and um, Airflow is a really easy tool when you know how to use it. And the many companies now they're moving to uh, to introduce uh, Airflow because it's quite powerful tool as well. So that one could be another great uh, tool to add in the portfolio. 
Yeah, so an airflow tool uh, or project would indicate some understanding of um, pipelines and ETL jobs. Cool, yeah. thanks for that. Uh, what we'll do is we'll post some links to resources on the Meetup page for this event. So uh, we'll post it in the comments. If you've got push notifications switched on, then you'll get a push notification uh, when we do that. But that can be a place where you just go and look for all the resources that we mention in the event today. So speaking of resources, have you got any specific meetups, conferences, publications, or anything like that that you would recommend to folks that they check out if they're interested in getting into either just data generally or data engineering specifically? I um, have been to a few conferences uh, in, uh, well, one in, uh, in uh, London, uh, and um, I've been in one really good uh, data council uh, conferences in New York last uh, November. That one was really great because I, I could see the, uh, there are videos online. Uh, I think they are still doing a lot of meetups, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and um, they are still doing uh, remote conferences even now uh, with lockdown. And um, so their community is really good because uh, they uh, had uh, data engineers from different uh, uh, industry. And uh, um, at that time, uh, last November, when I went there, I said, oh, data, really data engineering? Uh, is a really big, huge uh, industry now. So, and everyone is uh, looking for data engineers. So I didn't realize it since that point because that conference was quite an international one. So, and there are other few like this one. Um, uh, yes, I just sometimes just also follow uh, meetups uh, uh, group about uh, data engineering, which are uh, good as well. So, yeah. Cool, Sarah, any that you can think of? Yeah, um, so a meetup group that I quite like for, for learning Python is definitely the Pi Ladies group. Um, really, really good. And they had an excellent workshop this year that was straight up data engineering. It was great. Um, uh, so that's a good resource. And then of course the Python, any Python community events are pretty good as well. Python is a staple, seems to have become a staple data engineering um, language. So if you're going to be a data engineer, you need to learn Python. That's very straightforward. Um, in terms of conferences, I don't think I've actually been to a data engineering only conference, but I am quite a generalist, so I'm probably... <laughs> Uh, I like to know broad, broad things. Um, and saying that, I would also suggest looking into testing tools um, and things around data and, and, and good integration testing is very good for data. So if there's conferences that have testing, it doesn't mean that they're not irrelevant. Um, they're probably very relevant. Um, I did want to mention two events um, that one of our members, Devon, shared with us earlier this week, which was an Airflow Summit that's coming up and the Databricks Summit. Um, so Databricks is a tool um, that allows you to sort of have like a distributed warehouse of AWS and obviously Airflow we've mentioned already. And I would like to caveat this. You made me think of this, Valentina. The data, big data world is full of vendors who have a lot of conferences and you'll find a few gems in here, but do be careful if you're spending money on this because a lot of them, there's so much money involved in the infrastructure around data. It's very expensive and they really like to, the vendors really like to punt their software. So do be careful about these conferences. Um, they, it's not that to say that they're not good or that you shouldn't use them, but just be careful about it. Um, I went to one conference all the way in New York about data and a good 70% of it was vendors telling me very little, just enough to make me interested in the product, but then realize I had to buy it. So <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just that thought there. Um, I think the best thing you can do is, um, get in touch, look look on Meetup for big data groups. I'm in a couple of groups. There are lots of them. They're easy to find and stick with those and see which ones work for you. Yeah, I, you definitely make a good point there. And I think in all areas of software or product, 
people are just trying to sell you stuff essentially aren't they so and it sounds yeah. like it's very prevalent in the in the data world uh, what we we'll try and do especially because we're in lockdown now a lot of uh companies and conferences are making their talks available online. So what I'll try and do is try and hunt out some of these conferences and see if any of their stuff was online for anyone that missed it. And we'll post some links to that in the resources too. Okay, so we've talked about what you'd need to get your first job. And Valentina, you're very new to your current role. What kind of uh, sort of upskilling are you expected to get done? Say like in your, normally you make like a three month plan, don't you, with your boss when you yeah. when you join a new role. What kind of things are you expected to pick up in your first three months in a new role? Yes. Yeah, so as I said, this role is quite different than the previous one. So um, um, it's, get, it's really challenging for me. I mean, I'm learning uh, every day something new, which I love it. And um, my plan for the next three months is getting uh, much more confident uh, in uh, um, SQL and writing uh, uh, really good queries because it's something I haven't done in my uh, previous role and now I'm doing it more often. So I'm really like to have the chance to do that because uh, uh, writing a, a good query is a really important because you uh, need to optimize the queries so or make it uh, quicker, fast, and also the cost, because every time you call a database or you uh, run some query, it's a cost. So you need to optimize them. And um, became, so my, my goal at the moment, the next uh, three months, is uh, uh, being really good on that. And also, I'm, um, I'm uh, um, uh, upskilling my uh, DevOps knowledge as well. Um, and uh, I'm quite happy for that, because it, it's something I, I really like to work on. And uh, I'm using, uh, um, we use a lot of AWS tools in Sainsbury, and I'm quite happy to learn uh, how they, they work. And then they are providing also some training. So it's basically, they are the, my two main goals for the next uh, three months, yeah. Cool. And Sarah, when you're onboarding staff onto your team, what kind of things do you put on their plan for the first three months? So this can depend because a lot of my team, we sort of came in with generalist software backgrounds. Um, I was the only person on my team at, at when I started on my team that had any idea how to think about data architecture. Um, so that would probably be something that I would start off with is just understanding just understand how much practice or experience someone has with designing systems and um, understanding how data moves around and the cost of that. Um, it sounds really broad, but uh, the, the basics of it are, you know, it costs money to move lots of stuff from one place to another. Um, it costs money to store that. So it's very important that someone has a fundamental understanding of this. So we would work on your understanding of the cloud provider that the company is using and the tools inside there that they're using for us. So for example, in AWS, we made heavy use of S3, of course, as um, object storage or file storage and uh, Kinesis. Uh, EC2. So understanding those and how to cost them, how to look at costs. Um, and I think that in general has become a lot more, more relevant in software and for software engineers. It's not something I looked at when I, when I started doing software development. You know, you just build things and you let it out there and you didn't think about how much it cost. Um, so looking at that um, and looking at, at uh, system design, um, data engineering differs from software engineering in the sense that you you end up a lot more doing architecture and infrastructure than you do actually writing and designing code so i would definitely um anyone coming in i would evaluate their ideas on infrastructure devops architecture and we'd look at those and uh, upskill in whatever's missing if they come in with a sort of general development background yeah, very interesting. And you've both mentioned there about um, how it costs money and you're trying to keep things efficient in terms of money. And it's funny because when you're creating software, you want to make them efficient in terms of memory and speed and all of that stuff. So it's definitely a different 
type of efficiency on top of what you would already do when you're building something, which yeah. is really interesting. And what's interesting to me as well is that um, it's, you know, I think that data has always been the backbone of business. Even if you go back to before we had computers and everything, like you had to, and I'm an old marketing person, you had to know where your customers were and how to reach them. And now that's easier because customers are willingly giving us their data for free quite often. Um, and it's just so interesting that the old maxim that's been used for decades, uh, time is money, um, like it still applies now, probably even more than ever. Yeah. So yeah. we had a question come in. Um, Valentina, you mentioned about um, SQL queries and somebody's asking how you know what a good one looks like because they're just learning. So they'd like to know what a good SQL query looks like. Yeah, I at the moment I'm still learning that. <laughs> I'm joking. Up. I mean, uh, uh, a good one, uh, a good query, uh, in my opinion, according to my recent experience, is uh, when uh, you can uh, um, do different processes in a, a, a quick time, quick, relatively quick, of course, because there are some queries they are uh, they interrogate big databases, so in a reasonable, reasonable time. And uh, um, also a good query uh, needs to be easy to read as well. Uh, I found some query, they were doing amazing jobs, but they were really difficult to read. And they could be written in a different way, much easier to, to read. And um, yeah, th this one is also a, a good practice to basically try to make your query uh, uh, simple as possible in terms of separate, for example, um, just don't create a really long query, but if you can, se separate some component and call them, like uh, I discovered recently just uh, to create, for example, some temporary uh, tables rather than do big join, and uh, it was much easier. So just practice, you, um, you will learn just doing them and uh, that will make uh, uh, your query more efficient and also easier to read and to understand what is going. And uh, yeah, my opinion uh, is, is that, so yeah. Spot on. Um, queries are code still, you know, I feel like I need a shirt that says queries are code. <laughs> um, 100% um, readable, well-structured, um, a highly optimized query might be something different and it is possible that you may have to breach your readability to have op optimal code, but you should be very, very careful about this because um, there's always a developer cost when something is not readable. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think the key message I'm going to take away from that is don't worry, just do, use what you already know. So use your coding knowledge and your yes. best practice of coding and what you're learning and apply that to your queries, I guess, is, is what I'm going to take away from that. So we've come to our first speed round. Uh, if you want to tweet at us, here's our hashtag and our handle. I'd be really happy if you did tweet at us. Um, I'm gonna, normally what I would do is do two speed rounds, both with the same person, but we've got two guests. So this speed round is just going to be with Sarah. And the second speed round will just be with Valentina. So Sarah, are you ready? Sure, why not? Oh, you look ready. It's fine. <laughs> You've done this before. You've been on You've dished that before. So. I dish them. I don't. Uh, <laughs> so now I get to take them. <laughs> I dish it out. You can't take it. I suppose it's the motto, isn't it? Right. Okay. So, cats or dogs? Oh, I love both, but I have a preference for cats. Cool. Country you'd love to visit? I've been wanting to get to Italy. Oh, not yet. I've been there a lot. I would recommend it. I'm sure Valentina would too. <laughs> Um, burrito or pizza? Burrito. Mm. Favourite meetup? Players of Code, London. Da -da -da. Yeah, I'd be worried. <laughs> <laughs> like, what have I done? Um, second favourite meetup then? Mm, tough call between Pie Ladies and the London Continuous Delivery Group, which is great for DevOps. Cool. Yeah, nice recommendations. We'll make sure to put the links to that in the uh, in the resources for people to check out. Um, early bird or night owl? Oh, night owl. Yep. Marmite, love or hate? Oh, I have a story for you. 
Yeah. So um, back home in South Africa, we have Bovril and Marmite. And my mother does this thing where she mixes brands. So for the first eight years of my life, I thought Bovril was Marmite. And then I went to a friend's house and they actually gave me Marmite. And it was awful. (laughs) I was like, this is not Bovril. (laughs) Um, So not Marmite, the other one. Oh, I'm so sorry because normally I would do a trigger warning if I thought something was going to trigger something. Uh, I didn't realise this was a traumatic thing for you. But uh, it's funny, I think we all of us have got something from our childhood that we believed, we fully believed to be the case, and then it got oh, yes. debunked. So many things. So like many things. The world is magical and everything is okay. That was also a lie. Yeah, man. <laughs> is it? Oh, God. oh, I wish you hadn't broken it to me like that. <laughs> Favorite app? Oh, can I can I be real nerdy and say calendar? If it wasn't for my calendar, I wouldn't have a cooking clue what I was doing with my life. If it wasn't for your calendar, it would just be me and Valentina here tonight. I understand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> that would have been fine. That would have been totally cool. But I'm oh, glad you're here. Rugby or cricket? Oh, rugby, of course. Okay, I knew you would have. <laughs> Oh, okay. You'll have to explain the rules to me sometime. Um, Twitter or Facebook? Twitter. Kindle or physical book? Oh, I don't actually own a Kindle, but I do like them. But I don't own one, so I have to go with a physical book. Cool. Las Vegas or Blackpool? Las Vegas. Well, good luck. You'll have to stick with Blackpool for now. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Favourite meal to cook at home? Um, anything that can go in the microwave. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> My freezer is full of stuff from ages ago because I don't want to cook every night. And yeah, I highly recommend that process. Yeah. Cool. Um, a product you wish existed. You know, I should have thought about this five million times before. Um, people always get stuck on this one. I don't know. They're so happy with their lives that they don't need anything else. I guess that's a good sign, isn't it? I'm pretty pretty happy with life, to be honest. Um, I think a good one, I like to be efficient. And I think a good one that someone's mentioned before, actually, would be something that could tell me what I could make with what's left in my fridge. Yeah. I dislike food waste, um, but I also don't necessarily have all the brain cells left at the end of the day to think about what to put together yeah and some people can just make something out of nothing as long as you've got a few staples in the cupboard yeah yeah i'm getting there i'm getting there yeah lockdown project create something because you're back in so you should be able to create this massive database of all random things that should be in the fridge right yeah and some image processing and you know take a picture yeah Yeah, i'm excited well i look forward to seeing that (laughs) Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for humoring me there. Some of the questions were familiar to you. Some of them were surprises. So yeah, you handled that really well. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So we talked about what data somebody needs to get their data first into engineering job, what they will face in their first three months in the role. So when you're doing the role on a day-to-day basis, who are your main working relationships with? Yeah. At the moment, we're in lockdown. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, again, uh, since I started the new job in uh, lockdown, I I don't know all my colleagues uh, and the colleagues in other team uh, really well. So, but the, my uh, day-to-day work is mainly with my line manager, and um, yeah, and some of my colleagues. So, in my team at the moment, we are different uh, um, people specialized in different things. And uh, if I want to uh, know something about an application or something else, or a database or something, I, I go to the, the person um, who knows more about that. In uh, my previous work, uh, my job was uh, mainly with the um, uh, data science because uh, um, the engineers, we, we needed to know what, uh, what to do to make his job uh, better. So in, it was basically um, every request he had, we had to basically try to, to, to work to, to do that. And yeah. Cool. 
Okay, and Sarah, you mentioned earlier that it, data engineering is less about coding and more about architecting. So does your role as a data engineer require you to interact with a software architecture group? And if so, what's the nature of that relationship? Software architecture group. Um, so in my current job, that architecture group would consist of anyone in the team, really. So we we all have a say in our architecture. Um, you may get an overall direction from the tech lead group to which I would then take back to my team and, and provide. But if you're going to be working in a more traditional organization that has architects, um, you wouldn't have much of a job really left because so much of what a data engineer does is architecture. Um, so, I, so you probably interact with them fairly heavily if they had such a thing as a, a separate architect and a data engineer role. That's interesting because normally if you're creating software, you're very much like necessarily say governed, but maybe led by what the architect is saying it needs to look like but it sounds like in the data engineering team the architecture is done within the team and you don't necessarily defer to sort of like a an overarching architect yeah i i definitely think architects are very old school um it's definitely not a modern role and i would be surprised to find architects in more modern organizations anymore because it's a very you know, you kind of dictate, but you don't do, um, which often leads to a lot of rework. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, and as I mentioned, for this particular role, it's very hard to distinguish the two. Um, it's almost impossible to understand how you're going to work with the data without having any influence on the architecture. Almost impossible. Cool. Okay, so we've covered quite a lot of what these roles do and uh, what you're responsible for. And obviously, you're handling huge amounts of data at high speed, and it's 24-7 because, you know, that your customers are international um, and your clients are international, and the internet doesn't get switched off at 5 o'clock. And it's always 5 o'clock somewhere. Anyway, so is there like an on-call or production support element to your role? Um, and if there is, is, would you say this is a typical responsibility that most data engineering teams need to manage? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, uh, not in my previous one, because it was less, uh, um, le less kind of uh, uh, on-call problems. Uh, but because, yeah, we had the, um, some, yeah, some on-call stuff, but uh, it wasn't a um, big Problem, but for the the, the new role I'm uh, I'm working on, yes, we we have a kind of a, um, a rota to uh, basically out uh, fix this uh, this problem. I'm not in the rota yet because I'm uh, uh, quite new, uh, but uh, yeah, you have a lot of responsibility because uh, um, as Sarah said, uh, uh, the data engineer uh, creates all the infrastructure, everything uh, from scratch. And so you are responsible for everything that goes there. And if something goes wrong, uh, you need to basically fix it uh, uh, as soon as possible. And uh, you, you cannot call an external uh, uh, consultant or whatever because they won't know what you have done. So it's something you have to do uh, by your own with uh, your group or, or uh, yeah, the person involved in that, that work, yeah. Cool, okay, Sarah, did you wanna add anything to that? I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I think I would be surprised to find a data engineering team that doesn't have an uncle rotor because of um, the fact that it is such a DevOpsy role and you have to really know your entire infrastructure and your stack and everything, that it would be difficult to have an ops team and a data engineering team. It, it wouldn't surprise me if someone is trying this and if you find that sort of job, I would move on. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would expect to be on call as a data engineer. Yeah. 
Cool. Okay. That's really good to know for anyone who's thinking of getting into that. And also it makes sense because you don't want to come in in the morning and find out that somebody totally messed up your stuff. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So obviously data, it's pe people's uh, personal information and things like that sometimes. So how do companies ensure that their employees are aware of their responsibilities under the law? Do they provide regular training? Do you have to sign up to like a code of ethics or something like that when you join a company? Yeah, I, um, I have to do mandatory training uh, um, at Sainsbury's while, uh, and they were uh, quite long ones. And also I have to sign uh, um, some um, papers as well, of course. Uh, yeah, but um, of course the uh, more important data no one of the employees uh, knows about only few people knows about important data i mean uh, it's in all companies like that yeah cool yeah definitely on a need to know basis mm -hmm. yeah cool okay um so with that then we're going to go on to our second speed round valentina this time it's your turn yeah. so if anyone wanted to tweet at us this is our hashtag and our handle so Valentina, Mac or PC? Mac. Favourite country you've been to so far? Hey. How oh, many countries? Favourite country that you've been to so far? Visiting, not living, right? Uh, oh, up to you. Uh, living is just two, but visiting uh, probably three um, countries. And which ones were your favourite? My favorite one, uh, uh, Indonesia. Oh, okay. Yeah, nice choice. Favorite meetup? So, of course, it is so cold. <laughs> and your second favorite meetup? Uh, it's, uh, I think, a Pi Data. Yeah. Okay, cool. Mouse or trackpad? Trackpad. Best book you've read recently? Um, mm -hmm, there were a few. Um, ah yes, why we sleep is uh is the, I think it's that the title yeah uh, I'm really bad remembering the titles but it's really good analysis why we need to sleep and the consequences if we don't sleep and uh, actually yeah I probably shouldn't read that but it was really nice reading yeah <laughs> yeah I remember one of my teachers saying to us at school like what's the thing that you can't live without I mean well oh water food and they're like no it's sleep sleep so. yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Cupcake or donut? Cup, okay, uh, so, uh, sorry, donut, donut, yeah. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Kit Kat or Oreo? Kit Kat. Um, iPhone or Android? Hey, I have an Android, but I would like to have an iPhone. <laughs> so it would be my next phone, basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay, coffee or tea? Coffee. Silicon Valley or Silicon Roundabout? Uh, Silicon Roundabout. <laughs> yeah. Book version or movie version? Uh, movie version. Yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite website? My favorite website. I have a lot. I mean, probably Reddit. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Well, there is definitely a lot of stuff on there. Yeah. <laughs> they must have a huge database, actually. <laughs> um, music while working, yes or no? As in, do yeah. you like to listen to music? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite meal to take away? Uh, salad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, best advice you've been given? Best, sorry? Best advice you've been given? Uh, be myself. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant advice. I think everyone should go away and take that advice if you're not already. Cool. Thanks, Valentina. Thanks for that. We're going to go back to the normal questions now. We've got time for a, a few more. So with COVID, et cetera, most people are having to work at home unless you're sort of in, you know, a key worker and you can't do your job from home. Um, so how easy is it to do data engineering remotely? Is there some things that suffer from lack of face-to-face -face contact? Uh, no, in terms of work, uh, it's quite easy uh, to work remotely. So, I mean, if you have uh, all the uh, setups done properly, like VPN or uh, so the, a good laptop uh, and a screen, because you need also a screen uh, to check all the, for example, the um, when you write a query and you want also to check uh, the 
roadmap of the queries is good to have a screen. So when you have all the equipment uh, and a good uh, uh, internet connection, good um, um, tools to allow you to work in remotely, uh, it's perfect. But as I said, uh, I started new job remotely and I really miss the face-to-face -face interaction uh, because I, I don't know my colleagues really well. I just um, um, met them and during the meetings uh, and uh, um, I probably met just two of them during the interview because I did the interview before the lockdown. So I, I miss that, that social aspect uh, of my work, yeah. Yeah, I think we're all suffering from that quite a lot, aren't we? It's, it's nice to come to these meetups because then you get to see a few more yeah. people. So, um, yeah, Sarah, how's it been for you trying to um, manage or lead people remotely in data engineering? Um, horrible. <laughs> I, I miss my people. Um, as Valentina says, you know, you, I think it's a job you can do, but depending on how you are and who you are as a person trying to trying to work from home and missing that interaction and um you know it take it feels like it takes a lot more effort as well and people have to um keep an eye on their calendars and the time a lot more um people miss a lot of meetings and i often have to reschedule um mental catch-ups and that sort of thing um Whereas ordinarily, I just turn around and say, you know, hello, it's time. Um, yeah. I miss, I miss my people. <laughs> yeah, I think we all do. I and mean, you soon kind of find out who actually pays attention to their calendars. Like, oh, yes, for sure. <laughs> or who's waiting for you to give you that tap on the shoulder. So uh, you've both worked in data engineering teams. You've kind of moved around a bit. Um, and you've seen people come and go from your teams and also from data engineering. So where can you go from data engineering if you want to change? What sort of disciplines does it like lend itself to? So um, in my opinion, uh, well, you need to be um, a person uh, with a strong aptitude to learn because it's basically, um, uh, I saw many smart people, but they, uh, didn't want to learn new things. So I think this one is one of the most important quality you should have. And also, I think in data engineer more than this normal software engineer, you need to be really organized and your code needs to be really clean as well. Because uh, since uh, we manage a lot of uh, data and uh, in some case, for example, uh, the, the example of the queries I was doing, the name of the table, need to have a sense because you can put a lot of uh, uh, short words which they have a, a meaning for you but for other people they don't have any sense and so it will be really complicated to understand them and, um, and this one is also uh, something um, so the, and another good quality a data engineer in my opinion needs to have is uh, and needs to be able to talk to people also not tech people uh, stakeholders uh, uh, because uh, many of our job involves uh, um, other uh, people in the companies, not only the, uh, the development uh, side of the company, but also uh, the stakeholders, the product manager, delivery manager. So there are a few people and some of them, they are not tech. So you need to be able to talk to them as well in a good way, uh, make them understand what you have done and what you are going to do. Yes, as Valentina mentioned there, data engineering very much lives at the intersection of software development, testing, domain knowledge, analytics. And I think from there, you can go sideways and up. Um, you know, you could decide that uh, this, this data stuff is like interesting, but you actually want to work more on a APIs and natural systems. So you could go sideways back into software development. Um, you could go sideways into data analysis. Um, you could go sideways into project management. Um, something that you get from working on the data team is you really know what your company is kind of actually doing. You know, it's um, you're looking at the data you're getting in, and you not only can see what you're doing, but you can also see the potential. Oh, we keep this information. Why don't we build this kind of product that shows people, you know, you usually buy this, would you like this? You know, whatever. Um, 
and uh, but in terms of just up and down straight, it looks very similar to a data to a software engineering role. Um, so you could um, definitely go into management, and you could probably manage either a general software engineering team or a data engineering team, um, or you could even look on the product side of things, and you know move on to being a product um, manager or manager engineer. Um, yeah. But I would say the trajectory is very similar to software development. Cool. Thanks, both of you. So we looked at uh, what data engineering is, how it differs from data analysis and data science, um, who you interact with at work, how to get into it, what you can do afterwards. It seems like the possibilities are endless. So thanks, both of you, for sharing your insights with us. That is the end of today's session. So that is the sixth get, get into session not get on with it that's our other series um so thanks again for joining us everybody hopefully you've all uh, got something that you can take away from that like i mentioned earlier we will be putting the resources on the meetup page for this group so like i said if you get push notifications for that then um you will get one when we post in the comments if not it's not too late to set those up if you want to um, and our next event in this series will be with a data scientist. We're just working out some dates with them, but I'm really looking forward to that one. They have a really great career and they are a PhD as well. So they will be able to bring some insights from their academic uh, background too. So um, yeah, so our next actual event will be this Sunday. It will be Get On With It, which I know some of you have joined us for before. And if you haven't, um, you're very much encouraged to do so. It's just if you have a project or anything you want to work on, it doesn't have to be technical. It could be, you know, you need to do some studies or you just wanted to read something or you needed to put a shelf. Somebody put up a shelf the other day. Uh, just anything that you've been putting off and you want a bit of encouragement and moral support to get done, join us on Sunday. You'll be able to find the details for that on meetup.com. But until then, until the next time, look after yourselves and stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.